Well, good morning and uh, welcome. I'm glad to see such a great turnout. It demonstrates that our community is very interested in um, elected uh, offices and determining uh, the course uh, of our community. So it's great to see you all out. Um, it's such a beautiful day. We thought that, you know, perhaps we should all just go out and do some match play golf or something and the winner gets to uh, either keep or uh, attain the new political office. But I. I think probably there are people that wouldn't agree with that. So we'll move on. Uh, I want to first thank our presenting sponsors, uh, Portland General Electric. I believe Mr. Dean Funk is here for PGE. Dean, thank you. And Riverview Community Bank, uh, Mr. Larry Schwartz. Larry, thank you. Thank you very much. And your our stakeholder sponsors, uh, Gresham Barlow School District. I don't know, is Dr. Uh, Pereira here this morning, or, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is anyone here from uh, Gresham Barlow School District? Great, okay, thank you very much. Um, Metro Community Media, thank you, Keith. Uh, there are replay schedules on, on your table, so uh, if you wanna check in on that, please do so. Uh, we'd also like to recognize the elected officials that are here today. Uh, first of all, Mayor Shane Bemis, thank you for being here, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Shirley Craddock from Metro is here. Where are you, Shirley? Thank you for being here. Um, we also have uh, Gresham City Council President Kirk French. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, Councillor Carolyn Eccles. <laughs> Look at that, all right. They can't keep a good girl down, right? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we also have Councillor Mario Palmero. And I believe that's it for City. Did I miss anybody, City Council? Jerry Hinton? No, okay. Uh, we would like to also today recognize the members of, as my CEO likes to say, the best darn chamber uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, the uh, Mr. Dean Funk, uh, who is on that board of directors, uh, from, Portland from Portland General Electric. I think we said that already. Dr. Uh, Lisa Scari, Mount Hood Community College president. Doctor, welcome. Uh, James Hathaway, Transamerica Financial and president-elect of the chamber. Board. Uh, Carolyn Eccles again is here representing the city of Portland on the board. City of Gresham. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit dislocated. You know, I'm driving back and forth. I'm lost. I'm sorry. City of Gresham. Um, and is Dave Tukuk here from uh, Portland Adventist? Dave, welcome. Thank you. All right, I think we've done that. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our CEO, Lynn Snodgrass. Thank you, Brian. All right, uh, Mayor Bemis is here regardless of the fact that I told him that Olive Garden was catering. So we appreciate him continuing the travels here. Um, don't forget to pick up the replay. This could be a really important replay for all of you, so be sure and pick one up. They're not on your tables, they're at the registration desk as you go out, so we, please be sure and do that. So our future is in their hands. If they're in other hands too. I like to think my future's in my husband's hands or vice versa, but um, it, that is very important to understand and start to build those relationships with the people that have a very big say in what is happening in our lives here. And politics are local. It doesn't take more than, it doesn't get more local than this. The city council races and our state and senate races. So what I would like you to do is stop watching the news and get to know your candidates from the horse's mouth, the people that actually have an opinion and have a say, and it's also your opportunity to have their ear, not just the mouth of them, but the ears as well. 
So the old saying is, I'm, that is an old saying that get it from the horse's mouth. I'm not calling any of our candidates horses. So I want that to be clear and 20 years from now I don't want it to be brought up that I said that or called any of them disparaging remarks. So while the chamber has already endorsed some candidates, that does not stop us from inviting a broader range of candidates here because the goal is for you to have the information that you have that you need to make a wise decision. And today we're pleased that these candidates have taken the time to be with us. This is a ballot day. The ballots are arriving today and to have as many candidates here today as possible is a, a tribute to the chamber that they felt it important. But it also, they prioritize it too and we appreciate that. You will be able to ask questions of the candidates. On the table are purple pieces of paper. You can ask um, you can ask questions by writing them down, and Angela and Shelley will pick them up when the time is right. So this is how it's going to work. Um, we're going to have the state candidates first in a particular order, and then we're going to do Q and A. And then we're going to go city candidates, and um, they get to have their time up here, and then do Q and A. So you'll have two opportunities to ask questions. Each candidate will have five minutes to talk to you. After the state candidates are done, it'll be time to ask the questions. They'll all sit down here. They'll have one minute answers to your questions. And then we'll go on to the city council candidates and each one of them will have five minutes to talk to you as well. And when they're done, they'll, uh, it'll be their turn to answer questions. We scheduled about 10 minutes for that opportunity, both for the, the state races and for the city races. If there's time at the end, they'll each get a one minute wrap up. So that'll all depend on how good they are at looking at Shelly, who is going to have a three minute left, two minute left, one minute left, 30 second left, and then I jump up from that chair and pull them off of the stage so that the five minutes are done, so that everybody has an opportunity. Um, I will tell you though that I printed these sheets um, last week because I'm kind of one of those prepare people and there are two names that aren't on your sheet and um, I apologize for that but Anna Williams and Mario Palmerio's names are not on the sheets and please consider those um, candidates as well when you're talking. So here's the order so candidates we're going to see if this is a test, a skills test, see if you can remember what order you're in. So the state candidates are going going to be first Representative Jeff Helfrich, then Anna Williams, then Lori Chavez de Reamer, then Justin Wang, then Christy, is it Reitz or Reitz? Reitz. Reitz, thank you Christy. You got extra time, how about that? You got your name twice, okay. And then um, state, state Senator Chuck Thompson. So it'll be Jeff, Anna, Lori, Justin, Christy, and Chuck. And then I'll come back up and tell you the order of the city council candidates. With that being said, who's first? He remembered, here he comes. I'd like to introduce Representative Jeff Helfrich. Be careful, that's a big step. I'm first, I'm usually last because I let the senator, the fault of the senator to uh, always go first, but he's got gray hair so he wanted to go last. So I want to say thanks for everybody being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. For me, uh, being the state representative has been a very rewarding experience. I started off my public service career when I went in the Air Force, and from there I went on into, after I went to a deployed Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I came back and became a police officer for the city of Portland. So I've been in the Pacific Northwest for over 25 years. One of the things that I really enjoyed about being a police officer was engaging and talking with people and learning and understanding problems. And so as a police officer, I went to uh, somebody's doorstep or we're in their living room and there was a problem and how did we get to yes and how do we get to that yes and so for me it wasn't about political affiliation or religious uh, affiliation it was about we're here to solve a problem and get to yes and so I've taken that same step in the state legislator when I hit the ground running uh, back when I was sworn in in uh, December but I'm going to talk to Lynn so he said from the horse's mouth she talked about not being disparaging and so I get to ride horses for the city of Portland when I was in the Mount of Patrol unit so that was a great time for me to be uh, really engaged and understanding. 
Hit the ground running uh, in Salem. Uh, two of the things that uh, were the things that were most on my radar was education, and that was um, one of the things we heard about when it came to retention, ongoing mentorship, and the career development of our teachers. And we're losing our teachers at an exceptional rate. I was able to get a House bill passed, 4044, that relates to that and to study on that. And the problem for me that the, that was a very big thing because I had to reach across the aisle and get a lot of support from both sides of it to get it passed, not only through the House and the Senate. The other one was House Bill 4152, which is uh, regards to Eagle Creek fire recovery, and that got money for uh, new training and equipment for not only Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, but Hood River County Sheriff's Office. Then, the my political uh, 2019 uh, portion of what I want to do when I get back to Salem is economic development. That is a huge thing, e education, economic development, environmental stewardship, then on top of that, emergency and disaster preparedness. Those are those the four key components. Somebody's calling you. Oh, no worries. I couldn't phone, can I phone a friend with that one? Did I get a phone a friend with that one? All right. So, all right. So with that, the, so a lot of the stuff when it comes to economic development, you don't see, um, or necessary here, but I was on the House Joint Ways, or excuse me, the House uh, Committee of Economic Development and Trade, and that is a big component. One of the things we heard about in the Economic Development and Trade Committee was the enterprise zones or, or the opportunity zones. Those opportunity zones were directly related to the uh, census track, and that showed areas in which people uh, in those communities uh, were living, living below poverty levels, and there were certain markers. So what that did was create an opportunity for businesses to come reinvest with their capital gains and taking that capital gains instead of being taxed on it, they were able to reinvest in the community and bring businesses there. So we had two of those tracks in, our, in Hood River. They had some in uh, Gresham and in Troutdale, however they weren't part of my district, but Senator Thompson and myself wrote letters of support for that. Two minutes already? Wow, okay. Senator Thompson and myself wrote letters not only to our Oregon governor uh, delegation, but the delegation in Washington. That's that reaching across not only an aisle, but the river, an understanding that we have to have those economic development opportunities. So we were able to take that and bring those forward. The other parts of it, we need to be very business friendly and we don't need to raise our taxes. We have record revenues. We need to be able to understand and spend our dollars wisely that we already have existing. And then if we do have to come back to the voters and ask for dollars, we have to do that, but we have to show that we're good stewards of the public dollars. So for me, run Running and continuing in the office uh, is very important. I come from a family that has given back to our communities, not only through the Air Force or through our military service, but also as a, uh, in the law enforcement. And it's very important for me to continue on doing that. So, with that said, I'm going to yield my time. I should have about what one minute left. One and a half. One and a half. There we go. So, with that said, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'm Anna Williams, and I am running for or <clears throat> excuse me, Oregon's House District 52. Um, I've lived in the district for the last 10 years, and. Um, Grew up in Northwest Wyoming in a, a tourism-based economy just outside of Yellowstone Park, and so um, kind of have sort of a history and understanding of, of some of the similar challenges that we that I grew up experiencing. My dad was um, chapter leader of the Trout Unlimited uh, division there, and they did a lot of work as far as bringing tourism in and making sure that the impacts of tourism were managed and dealt with. And I think that that's something that our district really needs to look at as well. We're doing a really great job of promoting it. We also need to uh, address it and respond to it, make sure that we're not loving the um, House District to death, um, while at the same time, like Jeff brought up, uh, really focusing on economic development. So moved to the district 10 years ago, um, I actually came to visit and was like, that's my home, and moved there six months later. <clears throat> um, since then, I've been a social worker in the district. I have worked in sustainable tourism development as well, uh, really sort of looking around and trying to figure out what can I do right now to make this a better place for my neighbors. That's how I've been living my life. Um, my husband teaches at a high school in the district as well, so very involved in education funding and what teachers need, what teachers um, are experiencing day to day in the classroom, and how the PERS conversation is affecting current teachers and teachers who are considering retirement and our friends who have already retired from the system. Um, so I really want to continue that conversation and push it forward, make sure that the unfunded PERS liability isn't 
falling unfairly on cities and counties who are really struggling to pay some of those um, fees that are, that are building up and building up. And I know in Hood River County, we're struggling to hire enough sheriffs, for instance, because the, the, the burden is so high that our budget is too low to really attract people. And I think that that is happening in rural districts across Oregon. It's an issue that if we solve it well, can really have a significant positive impact. So um, that's something that I'm excited to go work on. Thank you. Um, I, as well, need need to talk about access to social services. I am a social worker, and I teach social work online through Simmons University in Boston. And we provide online education for master's level social workers across the country um, to elevate mental health access in communities that don't have a university in them. Again, that's something that I think we really, really need to look at in Oregon. How can we improve mental health access? How can we make sure that the folks who need access are getting it? Some of the work that I've done in my past included partnering with law enforcement and public health departments to send social workers out into really rural communities and meet with folks at the courthouse, at the DMV, um, at other public locations where they, they could sort of have cover for needing to go get mental health services because in very small communities walking into that mental health service provider's office can cause some buzz and people will often will avoid um, going to services because of the stigma attached. So being really thoughtful and creative about how rural communities live, how we do the day-to-day -day things that maybe aren't common in cities. I think having somebody who has struggled with those rural issues and addressed them in creative, innovative, cost-effective ways um, is, is a good opportunity for us to really think about how can we bring what our vision for Oregon to all of Oregon and not not really focus as much on what's happening in the I-5 corridor. I think those voices are being heard loudly and I think there are a lot of people struggling with jobs, struggling with housing costs, struggling with opportunity, with education out in those more rural parts of, the, of Oregon and that those are the people with whom I connect most easily and who I really want to stand for and represent. I know that's not who many of you are, um, but I think that it's critical that we really start partnering with one another across these issues and think about how how can what we're doing in Portland or Gresham or Sandy or Salem have a positive impact on what's happening for folks in Pendleton and Dufer and Hood River and Welches and um, so because we are one state and we are one budget and we need to make sure that we are working together and um, fairly assessing and fairly spending the revenues that we have. So um, as a social worker, my lens is how do we clearly define the problem? How do we evaluate as many possible solutions as possible without shutting our minds off to anything and then what it's going to be effective and sustainable in the long run. That's what I want to go do in Salem, and I really look forward to earning your vote. So I'm Anna Williams. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lori Chavez Dreamer, and I am running for House District 51, uh, which is just right next door. Actually, I'm going to be knocking doors out here in Persimmon, right here on the Butler side. So right afterward, if anybody wants to join me, uh, we're going to hit about 10,700 doors personally myself today. So I've been working really hard at taking this seat of House District 51. Why do I think that's important? We get up here and we talk to groups of people all the time during this, any time we run for elected office. We all have a story and we all have personal stories as to why we're here, what's important to us, and why we think we're better for the job. I don't think that I have any more powerful a story than most of you. How do I know this? Because of the 10,700 doors. People tell me all the time what's important and valuable to them, and what I realize is that I don't think people are looking for, you know, somebody who's smarter or better. What they want to know is are we relatable? Can they trust us? Do we have work ethic? Do we have integrity? And will we get the job done at the end of the day? And will we take their tax dollars and will we use it for what we said? And can we balance a budget and bring them back what they asked us to do? That's the job of a state representative. To listen, go down and fight, and get the job done. How do I know I can do this job? Well, I'm a mom of twin daughters who are now 24 and put them through the education system. I own and operate a business with my husband that we started 13 years ago, where we grew from four employees to over almost 80 employees. And I'm a mayor, just like my fellow mayor right here, Shane Bemis, who I've worked with for now, gosh, 14 years. I was a city councilor for six, and I've been mayor for eight. So it takes a mayor to know 
that we don't need to represent Republicans, Democrats, we need to represent everybody. We knock doors, I knock every single door, I don't target. I want to know who's important, what they have to say, and can I go be that independent, moderate thinker? That's what House District 51 asked for, a moderate thinker. Why? Because we need to solve some issues. Transportation, we heard over the last several years that we needed to do that. We passed House Bill 2017, which everybody knows. Mayors lobbied for it. My opponent voted against it. Economic development and small business. A lot of businesses are sitting right here. They don't need more small business taxes. They don't need more regulation. They need somebody who's gonna let them have access to capital. Let's get the job done, one stop shop. Education, businesses need a workforce. We know that. So we need to work with our community colleges. We need to work with our high schools and we need to get our students educated and graduated to be in the pipeline for you all to have access to those students and to that workforce. And then, of course, there's crime. Some of the things that I have heard over and over again at the door, people are concerned for their safety, people are concerned for their valuables, people don't want to be broken into, they want to feel comfortable every morning when they wake up, go to work, pick up their kids, come home. That's not happening today. And my opponent is not helping that. So some of the things we're dealing with as candidates, the negative stuff is out there. We're hearing it, we're down to the last 21 days, and we're being beat up at the mailbox, beat up on TV, you know what, we know that's gonna happen. It's unfortunate that it happens, but it happens. So I trust that the voters will look past that and the voters will know who they can trust because we've been out talking. I think it's important for everybody to know that we often say, well, we wanna bring everybody to one table. You know, sometimes I think about, well, maybe that's not what we need. But we do need people who can sit at both tables, where we can walk in one room and we can say, here's what we want, and then we can turn around and walk in the other room and say, you know what, we can bring these people together. That's what an independent, moderate voice is going to be for House District 51. So I want you to know I will follow through. I've worked hard my entire career to be a public servant. And I promise you, and I thank the chamber, for endorsing this race, for allowing us to be here to talk to all of you and do the work that you asked us to do. So thank you. Sorry I forgot my chicken balls today, but. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we have better food today, so, well. Thank you, Lynn, for inviting me, and, uh, uh, well, I didn't know we were recording, too, so. But. So, my name is Justin Huang, uh, running for state representative in District 49, and uh, District 49 covers uh, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview, part of Gresham, and uh, part of Portland as well. I'm a business owner, I have a joy teriyaki uh, all of the places, and I am a Korean immigrant, uh, FYI, uh, I'm from South, not from North Korea. <laughs> so don't be too scared. And uh, when me and my parents uh, moved here from uh, South Korea, we struggle, we struggle. I lost my mother when I was 13 years old and she simply abandoned me and my father. But that didn't discourage me or anything, it kind of encouraged me more to be a better person because my father sacrificed himself just by giving up his American dream just for me to pursue my American dream. And he's been working three jobs a day just for me to pursue American dream. And all that support from my family and the community, I was able to grow my business to 22 restaurants at age of 34. That means say, there's so many people around us uh, putting so much hard work just for their family to uh, pursue their dream, but sometimes they just can't do that because all this burnsome regulation and policies coming from state legislature. And it's just, I'm so sad about it. It's just not right. So I wanna make sure their hard work is not going to the waste. And I am confident that I can be the person to protect your hard work. And I know what it's like to be a small business owner and low middle classes. And I know what it's like to be hard working immigrants. And I do know how much is your hard work worth. Thank you. My name is Justin Huang.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chrissy Wrights. I am running for State Senate District 26, uh, which, in case you don't know, is the Hood River County line on the east side, goes south of the mountain through Welch's Rhododendron, through Sandy, back up through Happy Valley, touches 205, and then kind of comes and scoops out part of Gresham, but I do have some Gresham addresses, and then up the Sandy River, 84, and all the way back down. So uh, I put a lot of miles on my truck. Um, very happy to be here to get a chance to meet you all and because I was knocking doors here on Saturday and I just love that drive into this area with all those beautiful red trees so that was a nice welcome this morning. Uh, I moved to Oregon 20 years ago. I was a neonatal intensive care nurse in Portland uh, and lived there for about four years and then 16 years ago moved out to Hood River to raise a family in a smaller town uh, with my husband. And through my children, I got involved in schools. Um, I started out you know, cutting the construction paper and moved on to the PTO, and I actually am now the chair of the Hood River County School Board. Through those two experiences, being a neonatal intensive care nurse and working with kids, again, as a school board member, the thing that I have realized is that nothing exists in a bubble. You're, when you're born, we sort of think, oh, there, you know, infinite possibility for a kid. And that's true to an extent. But we are born into circumstance. Uh, we are born into a family. We are born into a, a country, a state, all of those things. And the same can be said for kids in education. There is really only so much we can do in the four walls of a school. And we can do it really well. But if we don't remember that kids exist outside of a school, we're, we're not going to give them as much of a chance as we could if we also think about all those other things. And so it is with this mindset that I am ready to get down to Salem and make decisions. And those decisions are going to be based on the fact that nothing exists in a bubble. So I absolutely am an advocate for education. I am a strong advocate for education. Education. I work with kids, teachers, school budgets, all of those things, PERS, every year. But I know that if we only focus on education, we are going to be missing the chance to really give our kids a chance to thrive. We also need all of those support services, affordable housing, health care, all of those things that support kids outside of the building in order to, to give them that chance. I also am a huge advocate for health care, but I do realize that when we make decisions about health care, those decisions are not made without consequence to small business. They're not made without consequences to the economy. So we really need to make sure that we are looking at policy in regards to the various things that it touches. And it's very, very important to make sure that that we think about the consequence of what we're doing. And the, the same can be said for the environment. I live in one of the most beautiful places on earth in the Hood River Valley. I, I, I fear for the snow on Mount Hood. It's less and less every year. I absolutely know that environmental policy not only affects that, but it affects the orchardists that grow pears in our valley, and that we have to really think about both of those if, when we make decisions. And the same can be said for the nurseries on the other side of the mountain. So what I can say to you is that when I go down to Salem, I will absolutely remember that policy is policy, but the people and the businesses and the economy on the end of those decisions are what is really important. When I go down there and I look at something, I will make sure to step back and look at what those decisions mean to kids, to families, to businesses, to people, and to really an Oregon that can thrive. So my name is Chrissy Wrights. I'm running for District 26 Senate seat. And thank you very, very much for having me today. Hello, good afternoon. Good to see everybody here. Glad to be here. Uh, it's been a busy, busy seven months and we're all getting down kind of to the wire. Uh, my name's Chuck Thompson. I've been your state senator for almost eight years now. So uh, most of you know me by now, I think. I've been here many, many times. Um, I was born and raised in Hood River, um, born into a pear orchard, and it's really, really hard to move a pear orchard. So um, uh, you're, you're kind of stuck, uh, and, and I don't know if it's destiny or what, but um, let's see. Uh, when I was probably 24 years old, my dad said to me, he says, um, and I was through with college, I went to college at Willamette, came back, and he said, well, are you, um, you going to farm or not? 
I go, well, geez, Dad, I don't know. I'm just 24 years old. I don't know if I want to do that yet. He's, I said, why, why don't you give me a year? Give me a year. And, and I, I swear it was probably a year to the day that I said that, that I was laying on the couch. I'll never forget this. And he comes in and he says, well, I go, well, well, what, Dad? Uh, well, are you going to farm or not? And I go, okay, I think I'm going to farm. So, uh, like a year after that, I got married, and my mom and dad, uh, usually the kids leave home. My mom and dad left home and moved to Lander, Wyoming, and bought a cattle ranch. So my dad got to pursue his dream. And um, he always felt bad about that because uh, he got to pursue his dream. Well, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I've had nightmares, but I don't think I had a dream about uh, what I was going to do the rest of my life. Uh, so he's all, always been excited that I uh, ran and got elected to this job. Um, I think I do a great job. And he's one of my biggest supporters. So uh, where did it all start? So I grew up in, uh, of course, born and raised there. <clears throat> Went, went to school like everybody else you guys did or whatever, came back to your community. Uh, became a volunteer fireman because back when I was 22 years old, that's what you did. You volunteered. Uh, so I, I served that position. I was a volunteer fireman for 35 years. Uh, just retired last year because I looked in the mirror and I realized I'm getting old. And maybe I can't uh, drag that hose around like, like I should be able to, but um, too many other commitments do. <clears throat> so um, I got involved with uh, local stuff. I joined the planning commission. I served like four years on the planning commission. Then one of my neighbors retired as a county commissioner. I, um, I ran for that seat, and 16 years later, uh, I retired as a county commissioner up there when Ted Ferrioli said, Chuck, why don't you run for state senate? I go, what, really? Uh, well, uh, my kids were grown, they were out of the house, all those excuses you have for not doing that, uh, I didn't have those anymore. So I ran for state senate and got elected. Um, boy, he thought, Ferrioli thought he really had a winner. I'd, I'd won four county commission uh, elections. I never raised a dime, never put out a yard sign, never even put a letter to the editor. Uh, and I got elected uh, because people knew me and uh, trusted me and, and I had, had done a good job. So got elected to state senate. Um, Senator Courtney, as a freshman, he um, asked, he's really good about this, what committees do you want to be on? I said, well, I want to be on the Main Ways and Means Committee. He says, Thompson, I can't put you on that. You're, you're a freshman. You don't know anything. Uh, everybody would give me a bad time if, he, if, if I did that. Well, he put me on that as a freshman because I know he knew um, budget issues and, and all that stuff. So um, anyway, I serve on that committee, the Emergency Board Committee, Business Transportation. Um, then he put me on the um, School Budget Committee and uh, just recently got put on the School Policy Committee. So I have one minute left. Here's what I what I see in Salem. Um, we have huge issues. PERS is a, a $22 billion unfunded mandate. And what are they trying to do down there? They're trying to get us. Uh, um, they're looking at small business owners to pay off that debt. Um, if you look at Governor Brown's State of the Union address two years ago, it was uh, small business is the um, backbone of Oregon. So what did they do when um, the Trump administration gave us a um, tax break? They connected the big corporations, the C-Corps, to that and disconnected small business. So that's 20 percent. So that 20 percent is going to stay in state state government instead of coming out here where we can do things with our employees, make our lives better, improve our businesses and do that such. And if you really look at our economy's booming and what's going to happen, the kicker's going to kick. And so they've taken our 20% tax break away, and the, they don't look ahead. The kicker's going to kick, and uh, they'll be asking to get in our wallets some more uh, in the next session coming up. And, and that's something I watch really closely. Are you giving me the hook? Okay. <laughs> All right, the next thing that's going to happen is please raise your purple sheets if you have a question, and Angela and um, Holly will go around and pick them up. The candidates that just spoke, if you would please come, I don't care what order, and sit up in these chairs. You will have one minute to answer the question, and we're going to be very close on those times so that we can move on to the city council candidates. So let's hurry. There we go. 
Yeah, it, no, it doesn't matter what order. I don't care what order you're in. And I need a microphone. Sh Shelly, can you bring the microphone up here? Here, Justin. Justin, there's One, two, three, four, five, six. I was supposed to move that chair up. I was holding that chair. Thank you very much, Kirk. Lynn. That will not get you brownie points. It just pointed out my inefficiencies. So. She didn't say I had to share this, so I might just keep this microphone. Okay, um, I'm going to read this question. It, it pertains to all of you, and again, one minute to answer. What experience do you have managing education budgets? Oregon is the third lowest in education rating. What is your plan to fix this? And you have 60 seconds to answer that. Okay, well, I'll start out. I am the chair of the Hood River County School Board. This is what I do. I do budgets. I, I basically help run the school board. So what, the, the, what I see we need to do is we need to, first and foremost, stabilize funding for education. It is really difficult as a district, and you know as a business, to not have any idea what budget you're going to get the next year. It is very hard to hire teachers. It is very hard to put program into place if you don't know that the next year you can afford to keep doing that. That's my primary goal is to stabilize education. I would like to see us invest more in career tech and vocational training in our high schools. We are losing kids in high school and they are not coming into our workforce. We know in Oregon we need a skilled workforce. We do not have that right now. We are failing kids and we are failing our economy. So that's what I'd like to see us invest in. Also pre-K, all, all of the data shows that we need to touch kids early. So that is what I would look into investing in. But my primary goal is to stabilize funding. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris. Justin? So I don't have any um, educational background. I went to actually, actually went to culinary school. So I have, uh, so I have a strong belief in trade programs and I like to bring more trade programs into the high school and it's, uh, it's raising a gradu graduation rate is a good idea too. But we, what we need to do is we need to have, we need to have those kids to get ready for their future by teaching them skills. and. Uh, at the same time, we're filling up their uh, baby boomers job that we're losing to fill. So that is my idea, bring more trade programs. Okay. Go ahead. So I don't have any experience with education budgets like Chrissy does, but I have been a nonprofit administrator and had to deal with nonprofit budgets and be very clear that once you spend a dollar, you can't spend it a second time. Um, responding as well to Chrissy's statement about stabilizing school funding, I think that's exactly what we need to do with my husband working in the public schools. He doesn't know from year to year how much money he's going to get to spend even with the, on curriculum within his classroom, and it's very hard to plan for sustainability and to grow and build a curriculum within your classroom that works for the companies in your area if you don't know what you're going to have access to next year. Um, so stabilizing funding and then working on making sure that our schools are preparing people for the jobs within their communities. So looking at local industry, investing through apprenticeship programs, bringing folks in that they can get to know um, while they're in high school, training them up, building skills so that kids can see why they need to know algebra well before their sophomore year of high school because they're using it in their day to day. They can understand how ge geometry is going to impact pack them in restaurant management. They, Thank you. Uh, school budget. Well, we work with our school uh, districts. Um, as the mayor, we do a, you know, a city budget, which is a large corporation budget, you know, over $50 million, and you got your school district. But when you're talking about the state, what has happened? They don't fund it first. We talk about stabilizing it. Yeah, it's stabilized up to, uh, you know, not fully funded. That's what we know. And how do we know that? Because now what's happening, school districts are asking the voters in certain cities and around the school district to say, you know what, now we need funding for operations. We build the schools. It's the state's job to do their job and fund it. The leadership hasn't allowed that. If we talk about career and technical education, Measure 98 passed. That's what the voters wanted. And again, it wasn't fully funded. So we know what the data shows. So what can we do to fix it? One, say what you're going to do and fund it first so that you don't use the rhetoric to go out and say, well, it's all on the backs of our kids. That should not be uh, the number one thing that's happening, but it is. 
Career and technical, we know if you work with public and private partnerships, we have a benefit with that. And you're starting to see that the, Depart the Board of Education uh, in Oregon is working with a couple of timber industries to pair up and get those kids into the workforce is what all of us need. Thank, Thank you, Lori. So with funding education, I was on Cascade Lock City Council as a budget committee member and then on into city council. So I understand a little bit about the government budgeting process. For me, I have two legislative concepts in play. One is to fully fund Measure 98, which then brings up our high school graduation rate. It's not going to cost the taxpayers more money. It comes from our redu uh, the governor came out with a blue ribbon panel. One of the ideas was to help bring down the PERS debt was to remove the comp or compress the time for unclaimed surplus property. It creates $200 million per biennium. That can help fully fund Measure 98. We have the quality education model or the superintendent's model. Those are two models that are in play that we can look at that have legislative concepts to bring forth to the, uh, the education committees that we need to fund education first. The superintendent models 33% of the state funds budget paired with uh, public safety, fund public safety schools first. The state legislator has to figure out how we're going to use the rest of the money, that's 67% that's left. That's, the, that's how we have to do it as our legislative body, or the legislative body in Salem. We have to fund it first. We've got to quit talking about it. So education, um, I, I sit on the budget committee for education in Salem. I've done that for like six terms now, and I have watched how um, we have underfunded education. Uh, the majority party in Salem has continued to do that. And when, when you talk about stable funding, I, what that means in my ears are, uh, is a new tax specifically for education. Uh, what, there's plenty of money in Salem, we, and, and, and we hear, uh, do the education budget first. What does that mean? It means that's the first budget that comes out of Salem every year. And so what that means is you've given schools the required amount of dollars it's going to take to fund those schools. And then all the budgets after that gets what's left over. And that's not being done. We don't do the education budget in Salem till like May, almost May or June, after the last revenue forecast comes out. And, and by then, all the school boards across the state are, go are going, they're trying to do their budgets too. And so it's really unfair. Uh, to them, but uh, that's what we need to do. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I'm sorry that we can't do more, but, and you guys are really doing a good job staying on time, but we're going to start with you, okay. Senator. Um, please describe your stance on the clean energy jobs legislation and why. Uh, that the clean energy jobs legislation is um, basically the uh, the new cap and trade program, the pro program where they're going to develop credits uh, to uh, pollute, pollute the air or uh, do that less and less. Um, I I don't have a problem with reducing carbon levels in our atmosphere. We all know we need to do that. It's got to be done in a way that when we're, we're done with this program that they've been working on for six years now, that it's actually got to show me that it will reduce carbon levels. But just to reduce carbon levels and then take those credits that nobody knows what those credits are or where they're going to go and give them to some other business like green energy like they did with the wind machines and solar and all those programs, uh, they have a lot to figure out yet before I'm going to support something like that. It's, it's got to prove that we reduce carbon Thank and you, yet Senator. doesn't affect all your it, uh, electric rates, gas Thank rates, you, and all Senator. that stuff. Thank you, Senator. I could go on. I know. <laughs> I'm a hook. <laughs> this has just kind of been, it's transpired into different items. And so for me, 2000, 2015, we've reduced our uh, carbon emissions by 15%, but yet 18% of our population grace has, has gone up. I see this as an opportunity to grab more money out of the working families or the businesses that's going to translate taking money out of the working families. I support reducing our carbon footprint, our emissions, but I think we can do that through uh, regulations like we've done, the Clean Energy Bill Act through DEQ that we came passed out of Salem. That helps that. That gives DEQ more money, gives them the opportunity to, to go after the polluters. But before we start taxing, adding another tax into something, we have to look at the cause and effect of that. And we really need to study and look at that, what's going on. There is uh, the climate change. We all know that. But where our impacts can we do in Oregon, but yet we still have polluters outside of our control in India and China, 
we have to address, we have to be competitive in our, our thinking and our thought process to make sure our businesses are have, have a competitive field to, to work within. So that I won't repeat exactly what was said about the data that comes in that we're receiving to make decisions on. One, is the data accurate? Two, what is the goal and how do we get there? And what's it gonna cost to get there? And at the end of that time frame, when you have the money that you think is what it's gonna take to get there, we don't have the data for that. That's the problem. But here's what I do believe. We're retracting businesses. The goal of Oregon is to attract more businesses, to have more taxpayers, to put more money in the fund so that we can have more programs, right? That's what we all try to work hard on. I will tell you, technology and the industry itself, they will self-regulate. That's what their goal is. We, Shane's brought how many businesses here? Big corporate businesses. Their job is going to self-regulate. Let's incentivize them. Let's encourage them to regulate themselves. And I think that, that we're going to get out of this problem, and it's not going to be by taxing. So I support the Clean Energy Jobs Bill, and there is actually quite a bit of data on other states that have implemented similar bills, um, whose economies have actually improved since implementing uh, a very similar structure. In Oregon, we would actually be joining with uh, a, a, a carbon industry that connects California, Washington, and some states in Canada, as well as in the top third, the top three carbon in, um, economy in the world. And um, so engaging in that, looking at the future, bringing in the jobs component of it, where we're using the money that comes from the fee if you are polluting more than you're allotted, to reinvest in jobs, training folks up to retrofit buildings so that they're more efficient, more effective, more sustainable, to me is an investment in Oregon's future. And I don't think we can afford not to do that. The cost of lost businesses, closed businesses because of fires, because of ice storms, are only going to get worse, lost homes because of storms. Um, so uh, for me, it's a matter of looking at what, what does it cost to do it? What does it cost to not do it? And I don't think we can afford not to address it. Thank you. Well, I do 100% agree with uh, Representative Halfridge. And uh, I think that bill needs to be a little bit more polish, uh, polished uh, before it comes out. Um, I don't think it's ready for it yet. We just need to do some more research and just making sure the, where the money goes. And any of the spending bill at this moment, I don't think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also support the, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and I don't need to go through uh, what Anna just said again. But I will say I also agree uh, with what Representative Helfrich said. It, you know, we do need to make sure it's done right. But I don't agree that we can wait. We're, we've, we've waited, and I look up at Mount Hood all the time, and that snow is going away, and that lack of water has absolute real consequence to people in this district, to business in this district, and to Oregon overall. So we, we just really cannot sit back any longer and wait for the people to self-regulate. There, there does need to be incentive. This is incentive. This is how it's done. So I absolutely support this. I support making sure that it's a good bill and it's a good policy. And at the end of the day, it does do what it says it's supposed to do. Let's give all of them a huge round of applause. This was very informative. You all can go back to your seats and finish your lunch. Thank you so much. All right, so city council candidates, the state representatives and senators did a good job remembering their order. Let's see if you can too. So the order of the candidates for city council is going to be Ryan Johnson, Councilor Mario Palmero, Paul Dreschler, Eddie Morales, and Councilor Kirk French. Ryan, Mario, Paul, Eddie, and Kirk. So we'll get started, Ryan. <coughs> can continue to write down questions too and we'll pick them up again. Hey guys. Uh, my name is Ryan Johnson. Thanks. I'm running for Gresham City Council position four. I grew up in a small town in California. Once I graduated high school, I moved to uh, Oregon in 1998. I worked in the auto industry for over the last 20 years, working my way up from a lot attendant uh, to a technician and then to my current position as an assistant service manager at Gresham Ford. Years ago when my wife decided to buy our next home, my wife and I decided to buy our next home, <laughs> Gresham was the obvious choice. 
we liked the small town feel, and then we were already actively involved in the community. Gresham is a great, great place to live and work, but as with anything, there's always room for growth and improvement. While it's easy to criticize from the outside, I made it a point to get involved and be part of the solution. I know that hard work and dedication, I know what hard work and dedication is all about. I've always worked for what I have and like others have struggled from time to time. But the people in this great community have mentored me and guided me through the good and the bad. I feel like it's time to give back to the people that have helped me and make me what I am today. I have a very good insider's point of view for over a thousand people I deal with a month um, between phone calls and people bringing their vehicles in for service. Um, I get to hear the praises and the concerns of our city. A few years ago, an opportunity to participate in the Gresham Chamber Leadership Academy um, came up and I was on the first, uh, I guess we call it, uh, first class, I guess what you would call it. So I didn't have any expectations and didn't really know what to, what, what it was about. So um, it was actually a really good experience. Obviously I ended up here, not a public speaker and this is really difficult for me, but I worked my way through it. So um, anyways, although I had been already attending city council meetings for the last couple of years, um, the Leadership Academy opened my eyes to different ways to get involved in the city and the state. Um, I, encourage, I encourage my friends to attend city council meetings and my customers also um, to get involved and uh, serve the community. Um, I currently serve as the chair of the Gresham Community Development Housing Subcommittee and I'm currently serving on the Gresham Redevelopment Commission and Advisory Committee. I want to be the voice for all the people of Gresham. I feel like the interaction in the community is unique. I feel like my interaction in the community is unique and gives me insight to frustrations and views of the people of Gresham. I'm not running for this position for my ego or my own agenda but they represent the community to be a voice for those who may have otherwise not be involved. I have been actively involved in Gresham community over the past decade and through community service, support of nonprofits, and attendance to city council meetings and community participation through the Gresham Chamber of Commerce. I appreciate all the support from my local community members and business owners and I'm honored to be endorsed by the Gresham Chamber. I will be a representative for all of Gresham, um, help keep that small, as we're growing, um, try to keep that small town feel. And it would be an honor for me to serve um, for Gresham and I ask for your vote. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mario Palmero. I'm a current uh, Gresham City Councilman, and I'm running for re-election. Now, I'm here today to ask for, obviously, your vote, talk about representation, talk about our housing issue, um, and talk about what we have in common. Now, I just want to clear the air right now. I know there's been some rumors that uh, I am not business friendly, which is not the case. I am very business friendly. I understand that your success is entwined with my success, our community success. So when things go bad for you, they go bad for the whole community. So I want you to know now that I support small businesses, uh, business altogether, and that those rumors are not true. Um, also, I want to talk about the housing issue. Now, we do have a task force. We assembled task force to tackle this issue. And one thing that was important to me, my, myself, and Councilor President French and the mayor was to get representation from all sides. I think this is important because Representation, without representation, how can you find and, and get to a correct answer, right? So what we did was open it up. We got 15 people to, to, to be on, committed onto, onto this committee and work forward to a solution. Without representation, it's going to be hard. Now, what I want to see out of this task force is the opposing view. For example, many people know that I am for renters' rights. 
And ladies and gentlemen, rental rights, renters' rights or rent control, whatever you want to call it, it's going to happen. The question is, do you want it to happen from people who represent you here in the city, who live in the city, or people from Salem who never lived in the city? And the only thing they know about Gresham is what they've seen when they passed I-84. So it's going to happen. So I want to, what I want to see is representation from this community to determine how they want to live, how they want to move forward. Um, for example, also, excuse me, representation, in terms of representation, also, I'm running for city council. I have five opponents. I'm the first Latino council president of Gresham, the first Latino uh, city councilman. And because of that, you know, I'm very proud of that service. But, you know, we have three other, uh, three other uh, candidates. One is going unopposed, which, which she is awesome. She's great. Uh, Councilor Kirk French, who's been doing a wonderful job, who who's, has one opponent, and then myself. And uh, also the mayor has an opponent as well. Um, you know, and, and that's interesting to me because I feel that representation is important in our city. If our city council doesn't reflect its community, how can we say it's representative? And if we can't move towards the city council or any part of the city, any department of the city that's not representative of their community, we're not going to be able to move forward. Um, I'll just leave it there. Um, my name is Mario Pomero. Please vote for me. Uh, go to my website, please, if you want to donate to, to my campaign. Um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come down here and speak in front of you. Um, and yes, please vote for me. Thank you. Well, thank you. I first want to say thanks for the chamber for putting this on and the opportunity to speak with you guys. For those that don't know me, my name is Paul Drexler. I'm running for Gresham City Council position four. Uh, tell you a little bit about me and my family. I'm a family man. I've uh, been married and with my beautiful, amazing wife, Amanda, for 17 years. We have two kids. Uh, David, who's three, and we've been foster parents and just adopted our daughter, Coley, who's four. Um, we go to Grace Community right up the way. Uh, I grew up here, so I went to Gordon Russell, East Wind Soccer, went to Barlow, track and field, graduated from Portland State, got my first job at Office Max, you probably remember that. <laughs> so, um, through a lot of career progression, starting some businesses, my dad was an entrepreneur, I've always thought of Gresham as a place to raise a uh, family and start a business. Uh, I've been in now banking uh, for 13 years and I'm a commercial lender. And basically that means I work exclusively with our business community. So I help businesses grow, develop, hire, um, everything from buying their first commercial building and pieces of equipment. I've helped people go from one to seven locations. Um, I've helped our religious and faith community grow and build, I've helped developers build offices and multiplex and shopping centers in Gresham. Um, critical experience that we need in Gresham, um, especially as we talk about some of the, the issues and the opportunities we have. Since then, I've spent the last five years on the Planning and Development Commission every other week, giving time and uh, working towards land use and development and other opportunities in Gresham. I'm currently chair of that. I'm on the Redevelopment Advisory and also chair of the budget for the Redevelopment Committee. Um, besides working with our neighborhoods and our businesses and our staff every day, um, I've been honored to have the support of the mayor and counselors. Um, in five times being appointed or reappointed to these commissions and committees. And so I wanted to say thank you for that opportunity. I'm running for Gresham City Council for a number of reasons. Um, we have a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of things happening in Gresham. Um, and I want to be part of that and we need young, experienced and strong leadership talking about where we're going. We have a unique opportunity. We have land available, commercial, industrial, residential. Uh, we have demand, we have leasing and pricing. It really supports development out here. Um, and we're gonna be building the next city. It's development is happening to us. Um, and we really need strong leadership on city council to really talk about what city we're gonna live in. So what are my priorities? The first one is talking about a better vision and plan for the city. So, and not just talking about our cores, which you talk a lot about, but our corridors, our business districts, our neighborhoods, and having a very, strong and succinct plan, knowing what kind of development we need. I live here in Persimmons, but we need more communities that have you know, desirability, high standard of living out here. We need to be developing and growing that and prioritizing that. But we need housing along the whole spectrum. We need multifamily, we need entry level, single family, and again, the, the neighborhoods like this. So 
we need to be just talking about that. Economic development, again, I'm passionate about business. I work all day with the, the business owners. So nobody understands more about the struggles and the impacts that what the city and policies we do are gonna have that. We need to be open for business. We need to be proud about that. We need to be helping people get started. Um, we need to be walking people through our code, inviting them to do that. So last and most importantly is we need to meaningfully and immediately address our housing. Um, everywhere we go, we talk to people as we're out campaigning, you have the privilege of talking to people and um, undoubtedly you're going to hear about homelessness, you're going to hear about affordability, you're going to hear about just a general lack of inventory, right? Whether people are lined up waiting for an apartment, they can't find a place to live, they're pre-approved, they can't find a house to buy, or they're just looking for a nicer place to live and want to move. And there's no mobility in our housing. We knew this was happening, we knew what our population is going to be, and we know what it's going to be. And we need to be having the smart conversations and planning and building our city now. So, and we can meaningfully and immediately address some of our housing stuff. We can talk about getting more labor in there. Our contractors cannot find skilled labor, which delays our construction, increases our costs, and again, creates better paying jobs out here. We can do it through code, we can do it through policy, we can invite people and make it easier to develop and get that reputation out here. So last, I'm just gonna ask for your guys' support. Please vote, it's important, this election matters. Um, please vote for somebody that's young, experienced, and has the passion and hard work to work for the city, represent the community that we're talking about. And what we're building today, my kids are gonna be living with, and it matters. So, thank you very much. Before I introduce myself, I want to just take a moment to thank our executive chef here at Persephone. This food is not from Olive Garden. It uh, was put together by the hard work of the people who work here. And so um, his name is Randy, and I would love to thank him for this delicious meal, as well as the service who are here, Jenny, Jeff, and Joanna, who, um, thanks to them, we're all enjoying this great lunch. Uh, my name is Eddie Morales, and I'm running for Gresham City Council, and I want your support. Although the chamber has already made its endorsements, I thought it was important to be here. Because if you're a business person like me, then you make your own decisions. Uh, you trust your instincts, and you know opportunity when you see it. I'm running because as many of you know, from your employees, your customers, other businesses, uh, Gresham is changing. It, is, it has grown bigger, younger, and more diverse. The average age in Gresham is 35, and 37% of the people who live here are communities of color. We are now the largest suburb to Portland and the fourth largest city in the state of Oregon, which means we are located at the fastest growing region in the state, attracting 40,000 households to the region a year. With this growth and change comes challenges and opportunities. As a homeowner, a small business owner, and community leader, I will work to see that Gresham is proactively planning and executing those plans so we can continue to be the great city we all love. But the sad reality is we're not keeping up with the growth, and we risk the possibility of being hollowed out and left behind. Today, one in five people in Gresham are living below poverty. That's 20%. With household income stagnating and the cost of living increasing, it is becoming more difficult for people to stay in their homes. People are having difficult getting to and from, difficulty getting to and from work, school, and play because of the congestion and the lack of adequate public transportation options. If we were to split Monoma County down 82nd, and everything west of 82nd would, it be, would, would be its own state, it would be the second wealthiest state in this country. On the contrary, everything east of 82nd would be the second poorest state. To fix this disparity, it takes leadership and cooperation between city, metro, county, state, and federal government. My strong and broad support will allow me to address these disparities with urgency. My work ethic, expertise, and ability to work with others to get things done has already earned me the support from Senator Merkley, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, city commissioners, metro councilors, neighborhood association presidents, and, and small businesses, and the majority of state legislators who represent Gresham. To keep up with the growing 
Gresham, I want to make sure that we invest in infrastructure to support this growth. And to do that, I want to prioritize four things. Housing security, because everyone who lives in Gresham should be able to get into a home and stay in it. Economic development and education, from tech to the trades, our industries need trained workers, and small businesses have been the backbone of our economy. Let's invest in our people and small businesses as much as we have put into attracting large out-of-state corporations. Safe and accessible transportation, so people can get around the city with several options, including green public transit, biking, and walking. And finally, keeping our community strong and together. We need great after school programming and recreational programs to keep families active and connected to each other as a community. We also have to be an inclusive and welcoming community that celebrates our diversity and is proud of all of our residents regardless of their background or their immigration status. A larger list of my priorities are on my website eddieforgresham.com, or on my Facebook page. As many as you know from my story, my single mother moved us to Oregon 32 years ago to seek opportunity and prosperity. Thanks to a supportive community and good government programs, I went from being a high school dropout after my brother was murdered to getting my first professional job 23 years ago at the Police Activities League here on Burnside in 172nd. I then became the first in my family to graduate high school, first to go to college, and again, first to buy my home here in 2010 on, in Persimmon, and to be a business owner. After 18 years of work to improve the lives of the most vulnerable, I have the experience and the skills to make positive changes at the city council. I am living proof of how a supportive community and social safety net programs can help make people prosper. And I want those things to exist for everyone who lives here in Gresham. Let's work together to make Gresham a place of opportunity and prosperity for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kirk French, and I'm running for council position number two. And I'm here today because eight years ago, I joined a nonprofit organization called the Chamber of Commerce. And I got involved in many community events, and I served on many, many committees and task force at the city of Gresham. And I served, and many of you don't remember this, I was also the treasurer of the Chamber of Commerce. And so I have had the opportunity to work in a dozen states, work with the agencies, a dozen counties, eight cities, and I know the frustrations that all of you feel with government listening to you. So a couple of stories here I want to share because I am a problem solver. And that is in one of our states, I said you have a problem, here's what's causing the problem, I know who's ripping you off, and I have a solution. And they admit it in public hearing, they were wondering where a hundred million dollars had gone. So I gave them the solution and they fixed it. Also, I built a business down in another state, a very diversified and poor city. The day of the grand opening, I showed up and picked the mayor up at City Hall and I took him to the site and I said, Mayor, thank you for coming and joining me here today. And he said, no. Thank you. You have saved our city. And I put 150 people to work. I know what it's like to run a business. I did it for many years. At one time, I was responsible for 3,000 people. And I know your number one expense out there is labor, correct? And when somebody comes and tells you how to run your labor, it doesn't fit very well in your, Justin, in your mind, correct? Is he left? Okay, so, so I dig that. So here's what I want to give you some other information too. And this is a kudo to all you business owners out there. New business licenses are at a five year high. Sorry, feedback. Job creation is at a five year high. And more importantly to me is investment back into the businesses is at a five-year high. So give yourself a round of applause for that. 
Right now, I assigned myself a task of working with the school districts on emergency preparedness. James, I don't know if you knew that or not. Is he still here? But I've met with all three superintendents. We're working on a plan. My focus is on accountability, public safety, and livability. I've had many successes in my life by myself, but more importantly, I've had it with groups of people. Let me share a couple. Let me share a couple of comments. Right now, we just completed year one of a five-year plan to replace and repair 25% of our streets without raising profit, without raising taxes. That's pretty amazing. And we're done kicking the can down the road. Number two, when I first went on council, the big concern from my fellow counselors was youth crime was rising like crazy, but we have no activities for our kids. Since then, we've turned that trend around. We have lots of activities for our kids, and the crime rate has gone down perpetrated by our youth. We brought Boys and Girls Club here, Open Metal School. We have mentoring programs for our kids now, family of friends, pathway to employment, and we have Skip. I should have said the other way around, summer kids in the park. but. The thing is, every year, that attendance is growing and growing. I have one minute left, and I just believe I am the, I believe, I know that I am the best candidate because I listen, I react, and I look for connections between all people to, be, to better their endeavors. Thank you, and I'm Kirk French, and I'm running for council position number two. Would appreciate your support and your vote. Thank you. Okay, little housekeeping, you are gonna be late leaving at one o'clock since it's two minutes after. Um, I, what I plan on happening is that you're gonna be dismissed at 1.15, so please be a little patient for our candidates. So if all the city candidates, the city council candidates would please come up and take a seat. A couple of things are gonna happen. Um, we are going to identify all of the candidates and who they're running against before we leave. <coughs> Um, so that that is going to happen not just with the city council candidates but the state candidates as well did did Mario have to leave he needs to come on in here please <clears throat> so um, several of your questions were similar so I've lumped them together so if I don't read the question exactly the concept was there we're gonna have time for two questions and I'd like it to be less than a thank you like it to be less than a minute so we can get through all of them and have it be fair okay um, <clears throat> excuse me one of the questions is oh, do we have the microphone yeah. Thank you. Uh, the first question we're going to ask is, what would you do to engage and represent the Rockwood neighborhood and other communities of color? And several of the questions had to do with neighborhoods of color and cross-section representation. So we'll, we'll start uh, with Kirk, because he has the microphone. I'm already attending Rockwood Neighborhood Board meetings, and I've gone to Rockwood Neighborhood Association meetings. Right now I'm reaching out to a couple of gentlemen who are representing the African American community, and we're starting to engage in conversations. Uh, I'm helping one of them try to move their uh, agenda along, and so I'll yield my time. Great. Um, so we've been knocking uh, close to 20,000 doors in Gresham uh, for my campaign, talking to people about what's important to them. Uh, we've created some paid jobs for people to be able to go out and talk to community and build. And uh, I think that we have um, left people out of the process. Uh, with the, you know, this, the disbanding of the Citizen Involvement Committee, neighborhood associations feel like they don't have a voice on the city council or to be able to weigh in. And I think other civic groups feel the same way. And so one of the things I'd want to do uh, right away is um, create a Citizen Involvement Committee that brings in our neighborhood associations and community groups, uh, particularly with the emphasis on Rockwood as well. Well, Rockwood in particular, uh, I don't think there's anybody that's been more involved up there for over the years. Uh, I used to manage the Key Bank on 181st. I was on the board and treasurer of the Rockwood Business uh, Coalition um, in conjunction with the chamber for many years. Um, I know a lot of the landowners and businesses. I've helped a lot of businesses up there. Um, 
you know, and we can all name some of them um, in the landowners and development opportunities. So uh, I've got a huge heart out there. I worked there. I was there every day. Um, working with that community, the owners and the businesses, um, and really, you know, West Gresham, all the way East Gresham, we need that development across the board um, and that representation. Thank you. Well, I live off 182nd. I live in the uh, Centennial District right by uh, Rockwood and the uh, Wilkes East community. So um, what I've known, what I've heard is what we, we need in this community is opportunity, just opportunity, not a handout, just an opportunity. And that's what we're trying to provide as a city uh, in terms of reinvestment in Rockwood and in um, other grants and programs. I don't necessarily think that we need to reach out to a certain race or a certain group. I think we should re reach out to everybody. Um, and I would probably do that by contacting churches and um, small groups that are already formed and then just reach out to not necessarily even Rockwood, reach out to all the different areas in Gresham. There's a lot of focus on Rockwood, and I think that's great, but there's also um, diversity in other neighborhoods besides that. Okay, Ryan, hold, keep the microphone. We're gonna do the second question. We're gonna start with you, okay? Great. <clears throat> no pressure. Specifically, what have you done at the city level or with the city to advance the priorities you have identified in your campaign platform? So what have you done at the city level or with the city to advance your priorities that you've identified in your platform? Uh, I'm involved with the uh, Gresham Redevelopment Committee, which I've, I've only been on that for a little over a year now, so I'm still learning processes there. Um, but as far as the uh, CDBG, which is the basically the HUD, HUD funding, um, I think I've learned how or where the money is going and where it's coming from and what areas need to be more concentrated on. And then I've also um, attended city council meetings for the last couple of years, so I kind of have an idea as far as what's going on. I don't have all the answers, but um, I'm willing to participate and learn and move ahead then. Thank you. So in terms of my platform, um, housing, for example, the task force, I'm on the task force for housing. Uh, looking for ideas on how to address this issue. Um, also in terms of uh, investment, um, Rockwood Rising, wonderful opportunity there. Um, in terms of reaching out to the community and bridging the gap between uh, communities of color and our police department, we are moving towards a new 21st century policing that opens up communication between the community and the police department. And also looking at organizations that really do help our young citizens in, in, in East County. Since there's very limited after school programs, we need something for our kids to do. And there are organizations moving to East County to address this issue. Also addressing the issue of uh, representation in terms of uh, the Russian speaking community, uh, reaching out to them. Thank you. Well, I've been involved for a while. I'm Rockwood. Uh, the, the, the old catalyst site, the Rockwood Rising, been involved in that piece of dirt for over 10 years, um, whether on the redevelopment and previously on the, the Rockwood uh, uh, Business Coalition. Um, on the planning and development, uh, we are doing the work every other week. We are streamlining our code. We're making sure it's coherent. We're, you know, putting things together. We're making sure it's easy to work with, um, and you know, working with the neighborhoods. You know, Carol Rula and you know Catherine and John who come out all the time, and then of course our you know developer and business community, and making sure we're holding the standards, but we can actually get things built um, that we want done. Uh, so we're doing that work um, almost every day um, in that. And most recently, you know, we just went through our parks and I want to uh, congratulate the council on you know doing the master planning once you know one a year um, and prioritizing our, our communities getting some of the thank amenities. you Paul <laughs> yeah sorry so I started a citizen engagement organization called East County Rising and through that we've been able to recruit diverse leaders from the community to put in uh, on school boards and boards and so I'm very proud to have helped recruit and place uh, Myra Gomez, Dr. Myra Gomez, to be the first Latina on the Gresham Barlow School Board. And we have other great people who are stepping forward, young people um, who want to lead. And so that is, I think, one of my biggest contributions to, to the city is identifying, inspiring um, women, uh, people of color, and young people to step up and lead. I'm also currently working to bring a health center to East County uh, for the most vulnerable women, too, uh, who need help, uh, access to uh, health care. 
so. Thank you, 30 seconds is not gonna be enough. Can you leave by two? Uh, I, I would say the one thing that uh, I'm proud of is Natty is working on the homeless. Um, I've done run-alongs with the homeless task force, or not with the homeless task force, but our homeless specialist who has been working very hard. I met with him recently. He told me, I asked him how many people he's helped. He said 300. And I said, well, what percent of you helped move on? And he said 80%. That's success, folks. Okay, just hold on to the mic, Kurt. Okay. So do not leave candidates, but I want all of us to give them a big thank you for what they did, their questions, thank you. Okay, so um, we're gonna do a couple of things before you leave. These candidates right here are all running in the same race, there's two more, and that's for position four. City Council position four, Ryan Johnson, Mario Palmero, City Councilor, and Paul Dreschler. The candidates right here are running for position something. Two, two. Thank you. I just was checking to see if they knew, I knew it. Kirk French, city councilor, and Eddie Morales, they're running against each other. So stay, stay right there, don't move. Janine Gladfelder, Councilor Gladfelder, could you please stand up? Okay. Janine is running for re-election. She doesn't have a, con uh, a contested race, so we save time by not having you stand up here, but thank you very much for coming. Now I wanna go to the city races. You guys still stay here. Um, Lori, uh, Lori Re Chavez de Reamer, thank you. Would you please stand? And you are running uh, in the same race as Janelle Bynum, House District 51, 51 thank you. And Senator Chuck, Thompson, so I'm checking to see if you know, and Chrissy Wrights are running in the same race. Chuck, what is your um, seat t uh, number? Uh, Senate District 26. Senate District 26, those two are running in the same area. Uh, Jeff, thank you both. Jeff Helfrick, Representative Helfrick, and Anna Williams are running in House District. Anna, you choose. She's choosing to run in 52, okay. So those two are running against each other. Did I miss anybody? Lila, what are you running for? Yeah. Running, <laughs> Brian, may I close or did you have some things that you wanted to say? Oh my goodness. Mayor, did you wanna come up and give your five minute stump speech? No. Then you don't get acknowledged. It's only people that work, no, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Mayor Shane Bemis, who now I owe a lot to because I forgot him, is running in a contested race. Um, Mayor, stand up so everybody sees who you are. Thank you very much. Okay, who ratted me out? Yeah, I'm in serious trouble. All right, so before I um, conclude, Brian, did you want to come up or do you want me to finish up? Okay, I'm gonna finish, but first I want everybody to wave to me from here. Because all the pictures of you guys is always so stale and you guys are half eating and mouths are open and you don't look happy. That's gonna be a fun picture. All right, put the economic summit on your calendar. It's called Puzzle Pieces. It's how we put the whole state together. It's November 8th, which is two days after the election, so we'll be euphoric that the election is over, that we can actually think about the future. I want that to happen. It's in this room from 7.30 to 11. You can go online and buy your tickets. You could buy a table, and you could send me to Roatan happy when that happens. Be sure and pick up your replay schedule. I think some of you will want that that replay um, to it to digest the information you heard today but also to um, pass it on to others the replay schedule from Metro East community is out on the table I want to thank again Portland General Electric we can't do this without sponsors Riverview Community Bank in Gresham Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media thank all of you for coming and spending extra time I hope you enjoyed the lunch see you at the Economic Summit